The title of my sermon this morning is Messianic Prophecies Part 1, and really the title is Victory in Jesus. Starting today and lasting pretty much until after Easter, I am going to go over 20 different Messianic prophecies, meaning Old Testament passages that predict the coming of the Messiah. Of course, I believe that the Messiah is Jesus Christ, as I'm sure most of you all do as well. So throughout history, there have been some very, very bad predictions which have gone horribly wrong. So things that people have predicted that just did not work out. And I'm going to read you several of these. I have a decent list of them, and I'm going to try not to read them all, but they're very interesting. Theor this is a quote by a guy named Lee DeForest. Theoretically, television may be feasible, but I consider it an impossibility, a development which we should waste little time dreaming about. And Lee DeForest, he was the inventor of the cathode ray tube, which I believe is the tube that was inside the old televisions. So, here's another one. I think there is a world market for maybe about five computers. And that was Thomas J. Watson in 1943, the chairman of the board of IBM. Here's another one. This is one that I find very powerful. It doesn't matter what he does. He will never amount to anything. And that was the teacher telling, a, a teacher telling the father of a man named Albert Einstein. So, the teacher said that Albert Einstein didn't have a chance. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us, and that was Western Union, a Western Union memo in 1876. Here's a good one. We don't like their sound, and guitar music is on the way out, and that was Decca Records Company rejecting the Beatles in 1960, um, 1962. Uh, 640 kilo, um, kilowatts, or like kilowatts, Ought to be enough for anybody. That was Bill Gates in 1981. Of course, you know, we have how many gigs of stuff on? I think I have like, what, four gigs of data on my cell phone now? Let's see. Computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. And that, that was popular mechanics forecasting the relentless march of science in 1949. That's it. Um, here's a, this is a very good one. We don't need you. You haven't got through college yet. And that was Hewitt Packer's rejection of Steve Jobs, when, uh, who, of course, went on to start Apple, the Apple company, made the iPhone, all that fun stuff. Uh, here we got a couple. Here's a good one, too. King George II said in 1773 that the American colonies had little stomach for revolution. Or, or, yeah, revolution, pretty much. Um, an official of the White Star Line, speaking of the firm's brand new, newly built flagship, the Titanic, launched in 1912, declared that the ship was, in, it was indeed unsinkable, which of course did not work out. In 1939, the New York Times said the problem of TV was that people had to glue their eyes to a screen and that the average American wouldn't have time for it. So they wouldn't have time for TV. With over 40, or okay, with over 50 foreign cars already on sale here, the Japanese auto industry isn't likely to carve out a big slice of the U.S. market. Business Weekly, 1958. Um, here's another one. This is Irving Fisher, professor of economics at Yale, on October 16th, 1929. Stocks have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau, and of course, on October 29th, 1929, the stock market crashed. <laughs> And here's, the, here's one that I thought. Frank Knox, U.S. Secretary of the Navy, on December 4th, 1941, said, what ha Whatever happens, the U.S. Navy is not going to be caught napping. And of course, on December 9th, or no, not 9th, September 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor while they were napping. You know, the U.S. Navy was napping. So some predictions have gone terribly wrong. One set of predictions that have not gone wrong, of course, are the Old Testament predictions of the coming Messiah. I mean, I believe that the, the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament are just so powerful. It, it, to me, it's hard to understand how someone can say that they didn't actually take place. But this morning, I would like to start our journey through these different Old Testament passages. We're going to start in the book of Genesis. And like I said, between now and just after the Easter holiday, the resurrection celebration, I shall be done. It'll be about 20 passages that we're going to look through. And we're going to just focus on what does the Old Testament say about the coming Messiah. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you and I praise you now. I ask that you put a special touch on me as I do my best to declare your word accurately. Lord, I ask now that you touch each and every one of us, and especially myself. Lord, and allow us all to take something away from your word today in your name. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to me to Genesis chapter 3. If not, look under your seats. Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to go 
starting at verse 14, but in a moment I'm going to summarize what Tabitha already read before. Throughout the 39 books of the Old Testament, there are over 400 prophecies which point towards the coming Messiah. And I believe that all of these, of course, were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They, they did the math, and essentially it is impractical, it's improbable is a better word, that one individual like would not be the Messiah if I think it was like 10 of them. If, if, if Jesus fulfilled 10 of these, it, it was all but impossible for him not to have been the Messiah kind of thing. I don't know if that made any sense. I mean, I can also, like I said, I believe that all of them are fulfilled in Jesus, and we see this in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and in, in the writings, um, the epistles. Today we're going to look at what many call the first prophecy of the coming Messiah in the entire Bible from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Of course, the context leading up to this involves God creating the heavens and the earth. We already know that, right? God made the heavens and the earth. Then he placed man, Adam, in the garden. An interesting side note, the Hebrew word for man is literally Adam. So it's Adam. It's the actual name. So I don't know if that, that is interesting to you guys at all. But of course, from Adam's rib, God created a helper for him, a woman whom Adam named Eve. Genesis chapter 2 verse 25 says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect life, lived a perfect life within the Garden of Eden. But then something happened. And of course, that something is sin. The devil, disguised as a serpent, tricked or deceived Eve into eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. While Eve was deceived into eating of that tree, Adam was not. Adam openly chose to partake in the one thing that God told him not to partake in. Adam ate of that, uh, that fruit. He wasn't deceived. He knew better, but he did anyway. I think that's just important to emphasize. Upon eating of that tree, they, they understood good and evil. You know, that was the point of the tree. I mean, before they ate of the tree, they didn't know what was good and what was evil because there was no evil. Upon eating of that tree, upon disobeying God, they recognized their sinfulness. And upon recognizing their sinfulness, they recognized that they were naked and they hid. They hid from God. That lack of shame they felt before about being in the nude has completely gone away. And now they are completely full of shame to the point where they're hiding from their creator, from God. I mean, and even today, it's hard for us to envision hiding from God at the same time. I'm sure every one of us have stumbled into sin at one point or another and felt shame towards others and towards our Creator. When God came looking for them, they hid, like I said. When, and when the Lord found them, everything became clear. When he, and then he asked Adam this question, Have you eaten from the tree which I command you not to eat? And instead of fessing up and owning up to what he did, Adam passed the blame. But what's amazing about this is not only did he pass the blame to Eve, in passing the blame to Eve, he essentially was blaming God. Listen to what Adam said. Um, Adam said, The woman whom you gave me, or gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate it. So God, Adam is saying that, God, you gave me the woman, so obviously since it was the woman who gave me the fruit, it's your fault. I mean, and that might be getting deep, and we're not going to dig into that, but that's essentially what was taking place. Adam was blaming God, and he was blaming his wife. Then, of course, God's attention goes towards Eve, and Eve points the finger to the serpent in saying this, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now look at Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read verse 14 kind of as a context for my sermon this morning before we get right into verse uh, 15. Verse 14 is the beginning of this list of curses, or not curses, I don't want to say curses, of discipline that the Lord passed upon the serpent, upon Adam, and upon Eve. Now the difference though, and this is just something I feel the need to point out, the serpent and Adam were cursed. Eve was not cursed. If we looked, I mean it says, uh, uh, verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle. And more than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go in dust. You will eat all the days of your life. And then if you look, what did he say? And then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten this. Uh, and more or less if you look down it says, cursed is the ground because of you. Adam is cursed. The serpent is cursed. You don't see that Eve was cursed. She faced, how do you say it? There was discipline that took place. There were consequences to her actions. Before child, before the, I mean, and this is another, I'm getting too deep into things here. I have this idea that it was possible that Eve had children in the garden. And the reason I say this is because God said that childbirth was going to be more painful to her. 
So since childbirth was going to be more painful, she had to have something to judge that on. And I'm wondering if she had given birth to a child before. Either way, the point is that now her childbearing process was going to be intensely painful where it wasn't before. Things were going to change for Eve as well. But she was not cursed. That's the point. But looking at verse 14, let's focus on the serpent now. <coughs> and you can go ahead and press down. Press down, Rufus. And then we'll get to the next slide there. Not that I, I, it's a, I thought that was a pretty picture. So Let's see here. So, like I said, my sermon today is going to focus on this part of Genesis chapter 3. In the curses, more specifically, the curse upon the serpent. And really specifically, I'm going to exclusively look at verse 15 in a few moments. In verse 14, the animal the devil possessed was punished. The serpent was punished, which is uh, something I never really thought about before. Because remember, the devil has possessed the serpent. And as a result of this, the serpent was involved in deceiving Eve. The Hebrew word used here for serpent comes from the word nakash, and could have been translated snake, of course. In verse 14, it tells us that as a result of deceiving Eve, the legged serpent lost its legs and was now to forever crawl on its stomach, which is where we get snakes from, I guess. But God also placed the serpent at the bottom of the food pyramid, I guess, or not the food pyramid, the, uh, the animal planet. You know, the, the, the serpent's way at the bottom now. I don't know where the serpent was before. Maybe it was higher along the, in the chain of animals or whatnot. But now the serpent's at the bottom of everything else. And well, I mean, it's, it's way at the bottom. No one, I mean, the, if you think of it honestly, who really enjoys snakes? I mean, I don't think there's too many of us that enjoy snakes. So as we're going to find out in verse 15, sin has entered the world and has polluted it as a result of the evil one, the devil. But guess what? God is a plan. So this morning I would like to take a look at the first messianic prophecy from the Old Testament, examining two things. One, the consequences of the fall of man, and two, the solution to the fall of man. So my first point, consequences of the fall of man. And of course the consequence of the fall of man, or the consequences of the fall of man, are enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between her offspring and, and his. And really, uh, the best way I would describe the consequences of the fall of man is sin and separation from God. Sin and separation from God. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and we're going to read the first part of it here. And uh, the Lord says to, to Eve and really to the serpent, and through the serpent also to um, Adam and Eve, I'm sure. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. So verse 3 depicts what, I, what we call the fall of man. This is the entrance of sin into the world. And like I said before, up to this world, things were going pretty well for Adam and Eve. Up until this point, things weren't that bad. I, mean, I don't want to say they had a perfect world, but they lived in the Garden of Eden. I mean, if you think of it, the Garden of Eden provided everything they would ever need. All their needs were provided for. They didn't have to go garden. The garden was there. There was fruit on trees they could eat. Of course, they weren't supposed to eat from those two trees. They chose not to listen. But they, were, they had all that they needed right in front of them. You know, God was, he provided everything they needed. They, they were in a state of euphoria, probably a, a heavenly state to some level. Another interesting element is that God walked with them in the garden. God was present with them in the garden. I mean, can you imagine walking with God? I mean, you ever have a question, hey God, right? You have a, you're concerned, you don't understand something, hey God. You could ask God. I mean, how awesome would that be? Life was just a little bit more simplistic for them. But as we're going to find out, we're going to see that the, when the fall took place, it changed everything. When man sinned, it changed everything. And we really see this. I mean, obviously, if you look at history from that point till now, you can clearly see how sin has affected our world. But just looking at the book of Genesis, I mean, Abraham, I mean Noah sinned, Abraham sinned, his son sinned. And then Judah, you know, the, the, the namesake and the head, essentially, of the tribe of Judah, which the line, the line of Jesus, he sinned. Throughout the Old Testament, there's sin. And even today, there's sin. Even in the New Testament, there's sin. Sin has torn apart this world. And the problem here is this, is God is holy and God is perfect. God cannot associate with sin. You know, it just doesn't work. I mean, you, you, it's like the two opposite ends of a magnet, right? You don't, they don't go together. They, they push away from each other. God cannot associate with sin. In fact, God hates sin. And as a result of this, He has to punish. He's forced to punish the sinner. I mean, not necessarily because He wants to, but because of just common sense. It just doesn't work. 
they repel against each other. A holy God and an unholy sin cannot be associated with each other at all. I mean, he doesn't want to punish mankind. He doesn't want to punish sinful mankind, but because of sin, he has to. The Hebrew word used here for enmity comes from the word or from the noun eva, and could also be translated hatred. So there's hatred between the woman and the snake, between her offspring and his. Eva is only used here in Genesis and then in four other instances in the Old Testament, twice in the book of Exodus and twice in the book of Numbers. Each of these additional four occurrences of the word have an overtone of hatred wrapped around them. Um, twice, the two times Moses used them, first or the twice in Numbers and like I said also in Exodus, but both times in the book of Numbers they take place in Numbers chapter 35. And I'm going to read you the section that they, are, that they take place in. Numbers chapter 35 verse 20 down to verse 24. Um, the Moses writes regarding murder and manslaughter, what kind of murder versus manslaughter, first degree, cold-blooded murder versus manslaughter. This is what he says. If he pushed him of hatred or threw something at him, lying in wait, and as a result he died, or if he struck him down with his hand in enmity, and as a result he died, the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He is a murderer. The blood avenger shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. But then verse 22 kind of gives you the opposite. And so you have cold blood and murder, verse 20 and 21, then verse 22. But if, you, but, if he pushes, or, but if he pushed him suddenly without enmity, or threw something at him without lying in wait, or with any deadly object or sto or of stone, and without seeing it, dropped it on him so that he died, while he has not... And while he was not his enemy nor seeking his injury, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the blood avenger according to those um, ordinances. So the difference between someone hating somebody to the point of murdering them and the someone who just accidentally did it, that's just kind of really trying to gain an understanding of this word. <coughs> the same hatred that an individual, that would lead an individual to murdering somebody was the hatred that's between, the, the division between the woman and the offspring, or the, the woman and the devil, and then their offspring. So, the obvious question is this then. Who are the offspring of the woman and of the serpent, or the devil? So let's look at the devil first. The devil's kind of a simple one. All the devil can produce is sinfulness, is evil. And as a result, the only offspring the devil can have are, are the evil angels, the evil angels, the demons, but also sinful mankind. Sinfulness. Anything that involves sin is the offspring of the devil. In a dialogue with the Jews, Jesus said to them in John chapter 8, verse 42 down to verse 44, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is, the, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And then the same John continues writing. Those were the words of Jesus that John recorded. John writes later on, 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 down to verse 10, Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of Man appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born... Of God practices sin because he, his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So the offspring of the devil are, is sinfulness, is sinful mankind, are the demons and all, all that kind of stuff. The offspring of the woman are God's people. The Old Testament saints and the New Testament church, meaning Christians and followers of God, but we have a problem. God can only associate with sinless and perfect people. 
God can only associate with sinless, holy, righteous, and perfect people. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, that there are none righteous, not even one. Then he continues writing in verse 23 of chapter 3 of Romans, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us are sinful, and as a result of our sin, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 begins, For the wages of sin is death. The consequences of the fall of man are a sinful nature to all mankind, which forces us to be sinful, unholy, unrighteous, and imperfect people. But God loves us still. The problem still comes to the fact that the consequence of the son of the of the fall of man is the separation that takes place, because God cannot associate with sinless, or sinful. Unholy, unrighteous, and perfect people because God is a sinless, holy, righteous, and perfect God. But God is also a loving God who wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us, both you and me. Because of this amazing love, God decided to come up with a solution to the problem of the fall of man. And this solution was and still is the Messiah. The centerpiece of His entire plan, the main element or the seed of the offspring of of the woman, which is my second point. Number two, the solution to the fall of man, a savior. The answer to the problem of sin, the Messiah, Jesus, and the Son of God. Look at Genesis chapter 3, once again, verse 15. And the second half of that verse says, He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So the offspring of the woman, he will be bruised. I mean, isn't that that's something that's in, it says, right? The, the serpent is going to strike the offspring on the foot. But of course, the opposite end is much worse because the, the offspring is going to stomp him on the head. He's going to destroy the serpent. Just before the Easter holiday, just before we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and his victory over death, we will be studying the amazing passage of Isaiah chapter 53, which a lot of people call the Old Testament gospel. I read an uh, illustration. I, I didn't use it. Of course, now I'm going to use it. Of, was a professor of uh, Old Testament studies. I mean, not really. I think he was a, a Hebrew, a Jewish professor that, that exclusively focused on Judaism, and and he was read this section of scripture, and he was asked to tell where it came from, and and someone read it to him, and he said, "Oh, that's from the New Testament," and of course it's not. But the Isaiah chapter fifty three is so is such an amazing prophetic experience of what's going to happen to Jesus. It's just unbelievable. What's written there was written 400 years before Christ even walked on this earth. Yet it so clearly depicts the death that's about to take place. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4 and 4 down to verse 6. Uh, the prophet Isaiah writes, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrow he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. I mean, the Old Testament clearly predicts the coming of the Messiah. It clearly predicts the death of the Messiah. Both in Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis, in Isaiah chapter 53. I can only imagine that what the devil was thinking when Jesus was dying on the cross. He must have been celebrating. But little did he know that that had to happen for our redemption. And of course, it's, it's done away with when he rose from the grave. I mean, the bottom line is that at the point that Jesus resurrected from the, from the dead, the destiny of the devil was put in stone. He was done. It was only a matter of time, and it's still only a matter of time. Sin is still in this world, but one day we're going to, be, we're going to escape from sin. We have victory in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, and all we need to do is embrace it now. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We were condemned to hell because of our sins, but we're sent to heaven if we believe in Him, if we trust in Him. And of course, my, one of my favorite verses, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, tell us exactly what we need to do. What do we need to do to get to heaven? Paul writes that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with your heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. If you believe in your heart, meaning if this information is true within you, if you believe what it says, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of your sins and rose from the grace so that you can go to heaven when you die, if you believe that within, you then need to confess that without. If you believe it from within that Jesus is who he says he was and did what he said he would do, but then you need to live out what you believe. Do your actions and your words reflect Jesus? That's what it means to confess. You confess that Jesus is Lord by making your belief an outward expression. You confess what you believe by making it just be what you are. I mean, when you're in the grocery store or, or at the post office, do they know that you're saved? Do they know that who they do, do they know who your Savior is? And I, I hope so. I hope that my actions, and as a pastor, it's a little bit easy. It's kind of hard for me to hide what I do. You know, I, I, I'm a preacher. That's what I do for a living. You know, that's what, I, that's what I do. It's not easy for everybody else. The question I have, though, is how do your words and your actions reflect Jesus? And that's what it means to confess. So if you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of your sins and rose from the grave so that you can go to heaven when you die, and if you make that known openly, that means tell others about him. Tell someone else that you believe what you believe. Even just here at church as well as in, in a bigger spectrum. That's what it means to believe and that's how you gain salvation. So let me close up now. So we have consequences of, of the fall of man is sin. Or were sin and are, is still sin. But the solution that God made for us. The solution to the fall of man is a savior. Is the Messiah. The Messiah is the solution. 18 centuries ago, a young scholar of philosophy from a Roman colony near ancient Samaria was, talk, was taking a solitary walk along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Thirsting after truth as the one great possession, he had drawn water out of every well of ancient learning and philosophy, only to thirst again. He had gone the rounds of the Sotics, the Platonists, the Pitrums, Peripatetics in the Py Pythagoreans, and yet had not one, not come to satisfaction and peace. But on this morning walk by the seaside, he met a Christian, then engaged in a conversation, and that conversation changed the course of Falvia Neapolis's life. The unknown friend showed him how the philosophers reasoned about truth where the Hebrew prophets spoke of truth as men who had been witnesses. He pointed out to him how the prophets had foretold the coming of Christ and how their predictions were fulfilled in his life and walk, meaning the life and walk of Jesus Christ. Taking the old man's advice, Fal Falvia, who is probably better known as a man named Justin Martyr, commenced the study of the Old Testament prophecies in their con um, confirmation in the Gospels. The conviction, uh, they, this convicted him of the truth of Christianity and he became one of the, a, a very well-known Christian and one of the greatest defenders of the truth and most heroic of its martyrs. He was eventually executed. That's actually why he, he took the name Justin Martyr, which martyr means someone who died for the, um, the faith uh, as a result of his conversion. So it's uh, just an amazing thought how easy any one of us can turn to Christ. I mean, no matter who we once were, so over the coming months, we're going to examine many different Old Testament passages which will all point in the same direction. They're all going to point to the Messiah. When we compare these passages with the New Testament, with the Gospel accounts of Jesus' life, as, His death and His resurrection, as well as the rest of the New Testament, I think that it's going to reconfirm to us, as well as confirm to those who might not already know, that Jesus is the Messiah. The bottom line, though, is that as Christians, if we believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and rose from the grave so that we can go to heaven when we die, and if we know this and confess this openly, we will be saved and we will truly have victory in Jesus, which is the whole essence of this sermon. So from the very beginning of time, the plan was set in place. God knew what was coming. And as a result, God saved us. That's because He loves us so much. So as we go forth this Christmas season, I think that it's important to recognize the birth of Christ, but it's even more important to recognize the fact that Christ came here in the first place to save us of our sins. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you and I praise you now. Guide us as we go forth. Guide us as we just worship you and serve you, Lord, in the coming weeks. 
especially around this Christmas season, Lord. Everyone's talking about gifts, Lord, and everyone's talking about these different um, elements of Christianity, Lord. But Father, help us remember the most important gift of all, and that was you. You came to earth in the form of man to die for our sins, and then rose from the grave so that we can go to heaven when we die. So God, I thank you and I praise you, and I ask that you bless this church as we seek you this Christmas season. Lord, bless this church and these Christians in here as we try our best to reach out to you and put our trust in you. So Lord, now I give you all the praise in your wonderful name. Amen.